I guess, you know, for the context of the book, you're kind of talking about Gen Z, but also then kids who are in school now and are dealing with a much more therapeutic culture generally than you or I grew up with. Uh, certainly me. Uh, you are closer in age to Gen Z than I am. But um, kids are different than adults. How, do, how does that factor into your uh, into the book? So a number of ways. When, it, when an adult goes to therapy, say, um, an adult, first of all, makes the decision, I want to work on this or I need the support. I know myself and I need this. And they, you, they absolutely, you know, you have their buy-in, the therapist has their buy-in and they show up ready to work. Um, number one. Number two, they've ha- lived enough life that if the therapist is a little off track or maybe the therapist got the wrong impression, uh, an adult can say, you know what, I-, I really think I gave you the wrong impression of my mom or look, my parents were difficult in that regard, but I wouldn't call them toxic and I don't think right. breaking off with them is the right move. Um mm-hmm. It's very hard for a teenager or a child to say those things, especially if they're angry with mom. They don't right. know if it, what constitutes emotional abuse, especially if an adult is leading them to think that they, that they were emotionally abused, say, or that they had experienced trauma. Um, so, and with a child, you don't have their buy-in. So a therapist right. is naturally going to want to pander to a child to get them on board. Now, if a child has a severe problem that they're coming to a therapist with, that sort of focuses the mind. You've got a kid who's anorexic yeah. or severely OCD, you know what they're going to be talking about. But right. you drop off a kid for general psychodynamic psychotherapy with you know a kid who's got some, some anxiety, some feelings mm-hmm. of the blues, and the therapist could lead in any direction. And I think that's what we're seeing. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit, what are the numbers and the trends in terms of uh, psychiatric um, uh, diagnoses of kids, you know, from, I don't know, you know, from two to 20 or, or thereabouts. And also with medication, there was, you know, going back, God, it's like almost 20 years when Adderall and Ritalin really were a topic of discussion for treatment of uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or just attention deficit disorder. There was a big discussion of that. That has kind of receded, but what what have you found? How many how many kids are on psycho uh, psycho? I was going to say psychotropic. I'll say psychoactive drugs and in inactive therapy. Yeah, you bring up ADHD. We only stopped talking about ADHD not because it was being diagnosed any less. There's more diagnosis, but because so many young kids are on SSRIs today. You know the mm. um, antidepressant. I mean. Yeah. They just cleared, the FDA just cleared Lexapro, which is a very strong antidepressant for seven-year-olds. So it's not that there are, we, you know, it's not, in fact, we've been going in one direction, putting kids on more and more and more, uh, you know, so psychotropic drugs, anti-anxiety medications, um, and and uh, speed, various forms of speed, as you mentioned, for ADHD. Right. So in 2016, um, one in six kids between the numbers of, between the ages of two and eight, this is according to the CDC, one in six kids between the ages of two and eight already had a mental health or behavioral diagnosis. Now, those kids weren't on social media, okay? Right. They didn't have smartphones, certainly not in 2016. They don't have them today. Um, so we knew that this diagnosis has been exploding um, and also ha- mental health treatment has gone in one direction. So um, nearly 40% of the rising generation has been to see a therapist already. Right. And, um, you know, I'm not the only one to have noticed this. A group of team of researchers did earlier in, a year ago and called this the treatment prevalence paradox. What they were noticing is that with with treatment of illness, the more you have treat, you know, the more treatment yeah. there is, the more the point prevalence rate of a disorder should go down. Right. We saw this right. with breast cancer treatment and other things. The the incidence of death from breast cancer went down with with more pervasive treatment here. There's been vast expansion of treatment and the rates of depression and anxiety have only gone up. And and I mean, supporters of that trend would say, well, that's because it's it's an epidemic. It's a pandemic of anxiety, of depression, of isolation, of whatever. But you're effectively saying that it, this is it's it's probably more caused by the intervention itself, because and before we go on to a, a longer discussion of iatrogenesis, uh, which I think is, uh, you know, a great uh, underappreciated concept in, in medicine in general, but certainly in, in psychology or psychiatry. Um, also talk about how the therapy culture has gone into schools, um, because it used to be certainly, uh, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 
Um, schools did not necessarily have a, uh, uh, teachers were not trained in therapy. They were not expected to be counselors. Most schools probably didn't even have a school, you know, counselor or psychologist or anything like that on staff. But now everywhere you look, that is considered part and parcel of K through 12 teacher education, right? And that's why we're seeing so much increase in anxiety, depression, and the known harms of therapy, because we are treating a vast population and mostly they are well. And here's the thing with iatrogenesis or when a healer introduces harm. If you have a problem, if you have a cut and you need stitches, a serious cut, and you need stitches, it's worth the trip to the ER. But if you have a minor scratch, then you only stand to, be, to face risk, right? You only mm -hmm. stand, because you don't stand to benefit, really. Right. So now all the exposure to MRSA and other, you know, uh, infections at the ER or other, sorry, um, you know, bacteria at the ER, mm -hmm. now you're just facing risk. And that's what we're doing with this generation. We're taking healthy kids who are a little bummed out, a little anxious, yeah. and we're loading them with intervention, as you say, much of it through school, through social emotional learning mm -hmm. and all the therapeutic techniques now going on in school. And so all these kids face this risk.